You did what you wanted, suffice to leave. This time, my family joins the fun going on over in the Eastern Heights section of Elyria, Ohio, where we all used to live. When last we met, I was waxing poetic over some old home movies. See, when I was a kid, we lived for a little while at least in this old house over on East River Street, specifically 937. Mom always talked about that place as being her grandfather's, which she also said he rented from the same neighbor we did. So I was doing a little digging around to see what I could find on the subject. I want to pick things up in 1919. We're a year out of World War I and a year away from Prohibition being enforced. The mayor is Asif Jones and Elyria is the 100% city. How do we know all this? Well, outside of the sign on the top of the building, it's in the newspaper. Everything is in the newspaper. Right now, nationally, there are six radio stations. In 10 years, there will be 600, but right now, the newspaper is how you're gonna know what's happening around town and around the world. And the newspaper everyone is reading in 1919 is the Chronicle Telegram, which started this very year with the merger of the Illyria Chronicle and the Evening Telegram. So, while we're here, let's see what's happening. Oh look, front page news. The Methodists are picnicking up in Vermilion. Small town papers are great. Vermilion used to be quite the popular vacation spot up in Lake Erie. It's about 20 miles away and was kind of like the closest beach. And it had a bit of a reputation as being the place to bring in liquor from Canada. Oh, check it out. Here's an ad for next year's Buicks. I don't know, that's kind of neat because at this time, they're still sharing the roads with horses. In what I think of as related news, right here on the front page, the Eastern Heights Land Company is petitioning the city to permanently pave East River Street south of their offices. You see, they're in construction mode, and East River Street is a main thoroughfare, so they need it paved to open up the rest of that area. Actually, I think this is the exact section of the street we were looking at before. Call it the 900 block. 937 and 941 are the first two properties that back up to the river and are owned by the Schultzes and the Fillmores, respectively. Recall their wives or sisters. Next to them live the Savages. In another front page article about record construction in the past year, I found notice of a permit being taken out for a dwelling on East River Street. It's a family with German Dutch roots who've been living in Cleveland until now and will become the next to break ground on our little corner of the world. Enter the first of my relatives, the Ursums. Here we're talking about Edward, his wife Florence, and their four kids Maria, Ralph, Eleanor, and Joe. The thing is, not too long after they move in, Edward passes away, naming his oldest Maria as the executor of the will. She ends up owning that house until she signs it over to her little brother Joe, but I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. This also seems like a good time to introduce a final family into our conversation. This one, first-generation Americans born of Irish immigrants, also living in Eastern Heights, over back behind the hospital and pretty much walking distance from where we've been spending all of our time. This is John W. Moran and his family, wife Mary, son Russell, daughter Mary, and the younger brothers Rollin and Cyril. It seems the Moran's teenage daughter Mary is friends with the Ursum's teenage daughter Eleanor because, you know, everything's in the paper. To that end, I found this on the Society pages in 1927. Looks like the eldest Ursum daughter, Marie, threw a big weekend party up in Vermilion at the Sunnyside Beach Clubhouse. Now, given we're talking about a Prohibition era party in a town known for, well, let's just say that was probably a pretty good time. Flipping back to the article, we can see that the attendees included Eleanor Ursum, who seems to have invited her friend Mary Moran, who in turn appears to have dragged her little brother Rollin into all of this. Rollin and Eleanor are my great-grandparents. It seems more than possible that this is where and when my great-grandparents met, or at least started dating. Two years after that, they get married and move into her family's place over on East River Street, where Rollin becomes the man of the house. At first, I didn't quite understand how Rollin Moran became the head of the Ursum household. Well, it is until I found it in the paper. 
looks like, about a year after the party, the host, Big Sister Marie, married the guy she took to the shindig, and not long after that, Eleanor's big brother Ralph marries Helen, the girl he took to the party as well. Well, there you go. Turns out, by the time Rollo and Eleanor decide to tie the knot, the only one left at home was her little brother Joe, the teenager. So, as of the 1930 census, Rollin is the head of household with his wife Eleanor, mother-in-law Florence, and his brother-in-law Joe. Note that R indicates that he's renting. That's because Big Sister Marie still owns that home. Almost a year passes before Rollin and Eleanor have their son Jack. That's my grandpa. And that's the house we've been talking about behind him. Here he is with his grandpa, John Moran, and here he is with his dad hanging out in the backyard. And that's how they lived for a few years. Rollin, little Jack, Eleanor, and Joe. Eventually, Joe meets Mary Kuchenreiter, a nice girl whose family lives all of about three blocks away. And they, as couples are wont to do, fall in love and get married. That's Aunt Mary and Uncle Joe in the middle. Obviously, it's their wedding photo. And that's Joe's big brother, Ralph Ursum, there on the left. For the time being, the newlyweds rent a place over behind the high school and start their family. That's them with their oldest son, Edward, I assume named for Joe's father. Meanwhile, back on the block, I don't know if you noticed on those previous census pages, but the house originally built by the Fillmores, 941, has changed hands a few times. Well, it all comes back around again when the little Fillmore girl who grew up there, Olga, now Sass, buys it as her and her husband's forever home. Unfortunately, it isn't long before her uncle next door, Charles Schultz, passes, and only a couple years after that, her aunt. In the end, Olga was really their only family, so Louise just moved in with her, and when she died, all her stuff just kind of passed to the sasses, including her house. You know, the one next door where we used to live. I'm guessing they already had this one worked out, because as soon as the sasses took possession of the one house, Joe's big sister Marie transfers the Ursum house into his name, whereupon my great-grandpa Rollin and family proceed to rent the now vacant house three doors away, which is how they ended up living in the same house we did and renting it from the same neighbors we did too. Crazy. Rollin and Eleanor will have one more. That's my Aunt Barb. See the shingles on the house behind her? This is our old place. Jack, on the other hand, will spend a few years causing trouble over to Lyria High and then going into the army where he will serve his country as a medic stationed in Regensburg, Germany. Now, this is 1952, so we're talking about a post-World War II Germany. Wouldn't you just know, stationed halfway across the world, he meets a beautiful young lady at a dance and falls madly in love. Well, certainly that's the story he always told. That's my grandmother there, Alice Hoffman. We just called her Mimi. Doesn't matter that she's got a four-year-old daughter, they'll make up a story to explain that. Nope, they're getting married and coming home to live with his parents. Well, at least until they can figure something out. Speaking of figuring things out, looks like they're not gonna hide the child, they're celebrating her. See that front page story there about a little German girl flying 5,500 miles to kiss Santa? That's my mom. And it seems little Patty Moran, who used to be Hoffman, is an orphan. Got it. That's gonna solve a lot. So, Mom saved her own copy of this, but whoever clipped it for her managed to leave out all the crazy nonsense and went with it. In retrospect, I might have done the same. Also, I think I have the photo they didn't use for the paper. If you look at them side by side, you can kind of see where he's the same guy and she's wearing the same hat, and also a new American grandpa, Rollin, worked for the Chronicle Telegram most of his life, and that's probably their mark there in the corner. I'm guessing they just gave him the photo they didn't use. Worth mentioning here is that little girl will go on to have a lifelong relationship with Santa and Christmas will be her absolute favorite holiday. Before we go any further, I want to take a moment to talk about Rollin Moran. I was aware that he worked at the Chronicle Telegram, but that was the sum total of everything I knew about the man. Here's a really nice piece they wrote on him after working there for 37 years. They even gave his title as press man, whatever that is. Honestly, I thought that kind of sounded like a guy who works at the newspaper title. Uh, no. I reached out to a couple of people who work there, and this is what one of them said. They're responsible for all facets of printing the paper. They would maintain the presses, make adjustments to the machinery, plates, belts, ink, that sort of thing, and then afterward clean it all up and do it again. It was, and still is, a very hard and dirty job. Ah, he ran the printing press. A press man, of course. 
According to the article, he actually started his relationship with the newspaper at the age of 11 as a paperboy. Doing the math, that would have to have been uh, probably just before the merger. From there, he ended up in the mailroom, and in 1925, at the age of 18, he moved to the press room, where he would work for 45 years, honestly, until his death. I was a baby when that happened, and we ended up moving into his old house, so I didn't really know him at all. However, given what his job was and that he very likely physically touched a large percentage of everything I've used here, I sort of feel like he's been sitting with me. I went back to the old neighborhood recently, and as you can see, the houses still look very much the same, but no one we knew has left. The sasses have long since passed, as have Aunt Marion and Uncle Joe. We, of course, moved a very long time ago. That's not to say this isn't still a living, thriving neighborhood with corner stores and barber shops. No. Life in this 120-year-old section of town, just on the other side of the eastern branch of the Black River, continues. It's just where we used to live. Next time, it's the 60s, and I think someone put something into the food. Where we all used to live. You did what you wanted, suffice to leave. The trolley of bread crumb, but I can see your cup is still half full. When I want to grow, when I go it alone, I can't believe the way my mind takes on the road. I can't find home when I.